Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11, and the Fairchild PT-19 by Uncle Jack Simulations. This is part two of the video series, and today we're going to take a look at the elevator trim, the pitch trim control on the aircraft, and also we'll have a look at the compass and how we can turn on to a specific heading with the compass. So the elevator trim is perhaps one of the uh, most frequently misunderstood things in the sim world and it's not made any easier by the basic desktop hardware that lots of us fly with. If you look at the aircraft from the outside you can see that there's a centre of lift around the main wing, there's a centre of gravity which is basically where the weight of the aircraft applies and that is forward of the centre of lift. So left to its own devices, the aircraft nose would go down and the aircraft would descend. To counteract that, the tailplane exerts a download. It uses the aerodynamic forces over the tailplane to push down and basically that offsets the uh, effect of the centre of gravity. So you've got the weight at the front, the centre of lift in the middle and the tailplane load at the back. Now obviously because the tailplane load is generated by the aerodynamic dynamic effect, the tailplane load changes based on how fast you're going. On a light aircraft, if you're flying slowly, you're going to hold the stick quite far back. And conversely, if you're flying fast, you can hold the stick quite far forward. And all the trim does on a light aircraft is take the force off the stick. It essentially resets and use center weight position on the control. Now with a sprung joystick on the desktop systems we don't have that luxury so it is harder to get your pitch trim sorted out because you have to return the joystick to the center position whereas on a real aircraft, a light aircraft, you just um, take the pressure off the stick. But let's say we've got the aircraft nicely in trim at the moment. We're doing uh, just under 105 miles an hour, 2200 rpm and mostly level flight, 2100 RPM. Rather than trying to trim the aircraft, I'm simply going to descend by pushing the nose down and then I'll take my hand off the stick and we'll see what happens. So no power changes, uh, no trim changes. We'll just lower the nose and once the nose is down, I'll take my hand off the stick and see what happens. As the speed increases, the aircraft nose comes up and then the speed will wash off again and the aircraft nose goes down and notice also what we talked about in video one that I'm not actually changing the RPM it's just changing because the load on the propeller is changing you can see the aircraft is oscillating but it will eventually settle down at roughly the same speed that we started off at so we started off at uh, approximately 105 miles an hour and it's simply oscillating until it finds that point so although we tried to descend by pushing the stick down, all we've done is cause this gentle oscillation. It's more pronounced if we try and pitch up. Again, I'll not make any power changes. I'll just pull the stick back, I'll bring the nose up, and I'll release the stick pressure. The speed washes off, the RPM drops as a consequence of the fixed pitch propeller, and the nose comes down. And if I don't make any changes, I don't make any input, it'll go well above 105 miles an hour, the nose will start to come back up again and it'll oscillate until it finds the trim speed. So that's an important concept to be aware of. When you're trimmed, you're setting an airspeed with, uh, with this sort of aircraft. The elevator can be used to make temporary changes to that state. So I can stop the oscillation with the elevator. I can hold a little bit of elevator pressure until it recovers the speed it was trimmed at. But ultimately, we want to be trimmed for the speed we're flying. Just check on the left here, we'll turn around to the left. So really what we want to do is to have a more controlled method of climbing and descending. If we can do it at a similar speed to the cruise speed, that will really help us for cross-country navigation later. So I know that this aircraft cruises around about 100, 105 miles an hour. If I can descend and climb also at 105 miles an hour, it means that my calculations for cross-country navigation are a lot easier. I'll just roll out on this uh, roughly northerly heading. 
and to descend the aircraft, rather than pushing the nose down, I'm going to make the car heat hot first of all, and I'm going to make a power reduction. And as I make the power reduction, we'll see the aircraft nose drop. Now my stick is still roughly in the neutral position. I'm just going to make elevator changes to stop any oscillation. But ultimately, the aircraft is now descending at around about 105 miles an hour. And it's a fairly gentle descent. But most importantly, it's stable in that descent. We don't have any of that oscillation. I'm not having to hold any uh, stick pressure. You can see the stick's right in the middle there. So the aircraft is still doing what it was doing before. It's still flying that trim speed of 105 miles an hour. Now, obviously, the reverse is also true. I'll make the car peak cold, and I'll bring the power up to around about 2400 RPM, and I'll just help it into the climb with the elevator. But once we're stabilized in the climb, I should be able to release that elevator pressure. So that's my hand off the stick roughly now. Maybe just hold it a little bit and the aircraft will start to climb again. Now remember, we've got to be careful with a fixed pitch propeller that we don't overspeed the engine. This propeller is optimized for the takeoff run. So at cruise climb, it's not very efficient at all. So this aircraft will struggle to climb at the cruise speed simply as a function of the propeller, uh, the propeller pitch setting, but we can do a reasonable job. They're climbing back up to 2100 to 2200. And when I get to the altitude I want to be at, let's say 2100, I'll lower the nose back to that level flight datum. I'll let the speed increase back to 105 miles an hour. And then I'll make the power reduction back to 2200 RPM. And we should be established in level flight. Now, if you experiment with this yourself, you'll find out that the concept of the trim speed is not exactly correct. And that's because of the propeller airflow affecting the elevator. If the elevator was in free air it and it didn't have any airflow from the propeller around it, then the trim speed would be more or less spot on. But anything that changes the thrust line, for example, putting engines under the wings or putting airflow directly over the tailplane, in the case of this aircraft, will change that ever so slightly. So as you descend with a lower power setting, your airflow over the tail is slightly slower than it would be in the cruise because the propeller's at a lower power setting. And uh, conversely, as you climb, you get slightly faster airflow over the tail. We'll just start another turn. But that's the trim. It's often misunderstood. So there's two exercises to try. And again, you can do this in any single engine piston aircraft, or indeed you can do it in any aircraft, but it's easier to see the effects on a low inertia aircraft. So something like a Cessna 172 or a PA-28 will demonstrate exactly the same effects. Two things to try, set up in level flight, either push or pull the stick without making a power change and watch what happens. And then secondly, make a power change without really pushing or pulling the stick and you should get a controlled descent and a controlled climb. Very straightforward once you've done it a few times. So we're just basically tracking uh, back and forth uh, across this, uh, this lake or this fjord here. This aircraft's got very basic equipment. We only have a compass. There's no gyro uh, direction indicator on the aircraft. You might be wondering what we need the gyro for when we've got a compass. Why are aircraft fitted with a gyro when you've got a compass system on all aircraft? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the aircraft into a 360 degree turn and I'm going to try my very best to make it a level, constant right turn. And what I want you to do is to keep an eye on the compass indicator on the instrument panel and look at the rate the compass changes. So we're on a southerly heading at the moment. I'm going to just check the left we're clear to the left and we'll turn left. So I'm just looking at the picture of the horizon, the picture the horizon makes with the windshield, uh, the windscreen frame, and I'm trying to do a level turn at a constant rate. It doesn't matter the angle of bank as long as it's more or less consistent. You see how the compass has almost stopped on that easterly heading now. I haven't stopped turning, 
but the compass has almost stopped turning. It starts to turn again. Coming through north, still turning fairly slowly. I've got a fairly reasonable, fairly constant angle of bank all the way through. I'm climbing a little bit, but that won't affect the compass. And as we go through west, you can see the compass starts to accelerate. And as we come on to a southerly heading, oh, that's indicating south at the moment, but that's not actually south. Let's go a little bit further, and then we'll roll wings level, and that should be back where we started off. So what you're seeing there is a compass error, a compass turning error. The reason you get the compass turning error is fairly complicated. It's to do with the shape of the Earth's magnetic field and the way the compass is constructed. The compass isn't uh, mechanically balanced. There's a, almost like a weight in the compass to offset the dip effect of the Earth's magnetic field. That's more complicated than really what we need to know as pilots. All we need to understand is the fact that our compass does not give us reliable information unless we're flying straight and level. So what if I want to turn onto a specific heading? I'm flying south at the moment and I want to turn onto a northerly heading. I'm going to make a left turn onto a northerly heading. Well, there's a mnemonic I want you to keep in mind, and that's UNOS, undershoot north, overshoot south. Let's put that into practice. I'll roll to the left, same angle of bank, and I want to undershoot north. Some people use OSUN, it's the same thing, overshoot south, undershoot north. What it means is undershoot north, I'm banking around about 15 degrees angle of bank, so I'm going to roll wings level about 15 degrees before north on the compass indication. So I'm looking for about 15 degrees. When it indicates 15 degrees, I'm going to roll wings level and see where we are. There's 30, 20, 15, roll wings level, and then we roll out on a northerly heading. Undershoot north. So the opposite is true. When we turn onto the southerly heading, we're going to overshoot the southerly heading. I'll do it left again, although it doesn't make any difference. You can do the same thing going both ways. It's just this aircraft prepare, uh, is tidier in a left-hand turn. So check the left. We're clear on the left. Round we go. You see that uh, compass is still pointing north. So it's kind of, it's a bit sluggish around about the, the north. And when you point south, it gets a little bit more excited. It turns a lot quicker. So we're going to overshoot south by 15 degrees. So I'm trying my best to keep the angle of bank correct. So there's south indicated. I'll go another 15 degrees. There's 10, 15, and then roll wings level. And you see the compass rolls back and we're on a southerly heading. Okay, it's as simple as that. Undershoot north overshoot south. There's another manifestation of the compass errors and that's to do with acceleration. I'm just going to make a turn through 90 degrees. So as I said the compass has got a weight in there to offset the effect of the Earth's magnetic field. When we're turning onto an east or a west heading the compass is more or less accurate. Uh, we, we don't have the same issues. It's really pronounced at north and south headings. But on east and west, it's not too bad. There's roughly an easterly heading. So we don't have turning errors when we're flying east and west, but we do have acceleration errors. If I make the car peat hot momentarily, and I bring the power all the way to idle, look at that compass swing round. It's gone round to 120 or 110. I'll let the aircraft slow down, and I'll keep it pointing on the same heading. Just holding the pitch attitude, letting it slow down. Holding the altitude, sorry, letting it slow down. Okay, I'm going to make the car peak cold. And I'm going to put a load of power on, and I'll keep the aircraft pointing roughly on the same heading. Look as we accelerate, the compass swings round to point to north. 
or to, to tend towards north. Now this aircraft isn't very powerful at all, so you don't get a lot of compass acceleration errors. But as you accelerate, it'll tend towards the north, and as you decelerate, it'll tend towards the south. Let's look at that turning error one more time. We'll go to the right this time. I want to overshoot south. So I'm going to overshoot south by about 15 degrees, just to prove it works to the right as well. There's south now. I'll keep turning for another 15 degrees. Another 15 degrees indicated. And we'll roll wings level. Now that 15 degrees for 15 degrees angle of bank, it's just really a, a rule of thumb. It's just something to, to start off with. Ultimately, with a compass, you have to get the wings level, take a reading, and then fix it ever so slightly. It's, it's as simple as that. So just correct ever so slightly by a few degrees, and that should put us onto that southerly heading. So there's two mnemonics we learned. There's uh, UNOS, undershoot north, overshoot south. OSUN is also the same mnemonic. And we talked about ANDS as well, accelerate north, decelerate south. Practically, the first one is of benefit to you because you can turn the aircraft onto a heading. The acceleration errors, it's just something to be aware of. It's a demonstration to demonstrate how the compass works. Obviously, if you're in the southern hemisphere, those um, rules of thumb have to be reversed because of the shape of the magnetic field. The compasses uh, for use in the southern hemisphere are balanced differently. So I've never had the luxury or the privilege of flying a light aircraft in the southern hemisphere, but it's it's just different. It's, it's back to front, if you like. Not to say one's more correct than the other. It's just the majority of uh, aircraft compasses, uh, the reference material is written with the Northern Hemisphere in mind. And that's us. We'll head back to the airfield and then we'll have a look at uh, taking the aircraft around the traffic pattern. I hope this video made sense. If you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. I look uh, forward to reading your comments and I will try and get back to everybody that comments on the video. It does uh, often take me a few weeks just depending on what's going on at work. I hope you'll join me again for the next video when we fly the aircraft around the pattern. Thanks very much.